That's because Hello, true family. Yes, it is. Legal form. You are still subject to the so same thing. Black people that you may think that you better than the subject. The way you get by the boy information. The wake up call for you all. If it can happen to me, a very successful, very well known attorney in front of his law office, it can happen to you. So let's not pretend like this is not a problem. Because a lot of people, they'll say, oh, well, you know. It just happened because you weren't doing something right. I mean, you shouldn't have resisted your liberty. I literally could have had a hole in the back of my head. You understand? So this is how serious this issue is to me. So I want you to keep that in mind as we continue forward. This is as real as, as real can be. Because our main issue here in the United States is that um, you know we are still the same people that they thought we were when they brought us over. So keep that in mind. But uh, other than that, I'll pass it off to my colleague. Good afternoon, everyone. All right. My name is Demarcus Ward. Uh, I've been practicing for 16 years, not quite 23. I'm not in my Jordan year yet. Uh, uh, I'm from Dallas. Uh, the unique experience that I have is that I actually spent five years as a district attorney in Dallas County. Uh, so prior to starting my own practice 10 years ago, uh, with Daniel White, who some of you may have seen earlier this morning. Uh, I spent a number of years in the DA's office there. He also spent five years in the DA's office in Cook County in Chicago. So uh, I've seen and I've heard some of what Mr. Sperling is saying, uh, because a lot of times, even though you're black, the powers that be believe that since you have elected to be a prosecutor, then you know you believe certain things even about your own people. Uh, once I got the experience that I wanted to get, uh, as far as trying everything from a small DWI all the way up to capital murder, uh, I left. I was there for a reason to get all the experience that I could get and to use it on the other side. And I have. So one of the things I want to talk to everybody about uh, are policy changes that I think uh, we can we can do to make things better. And also, I want y'all to know kind of what goes on on the inside, uh, what these folks really say behind closed doors, how they think, what their strategies are, and also some of the things that the officers will say to as well. So uh, hopefully, we can give you guys some information today, and also be a source of information after today as well. Great. Um, so I want to know what are some of the fundamental rights that individuals should be aware of in various legal situations, such as interactions with law enforcement, employment disputes, and landlord-tenant issues? If, if you guys are I'll start with interactions with law, with law enforcement. Uh, one of the big questions that I always get from folks is, do they have to read me my rights while I'm out there in the street? You know, I'll have a client that comes into my office for a, a number of things, and they'll say, well, DeMarcus, he didn't read me my rights. So all this stuff just gets thrown out. Uh, and I have to tell them, that's just not how it works. The police don't have to read you your rights right then and there. I think they should. But the law doesn't say that everything just goes away because they didn't read you your rights. Generally, in Texas, and in this consistent all over the U.S., uh, you have a right to know what you've been charged with within a quote unquote reasonable amount of time. Most states say you need to be arraigned by a magistrate judge within 24 hours of being arrested. So I say that to say if you're out on the streets and the police arrest you, and, and you're pissed off and rightfully so because they're not telling you what it's for, they're not telling you where you're going, a lot of times they're not letting you call anybody. Uh, the problem arises if it goes, like if you go to jail on a Friday and it's a Sunday and you still haven't heard from anybody, that's when, that's when the problem arises. So that's one of the big, big, big things I tell folks because it just seems to be this question that I get literally every day from, from somebody. Well, and not to cut you off, but is that something new? Because a lot, I, I feel like the media um, pushes that you need to know your rights like right away as you're in, in the midst of being arrested or interacting with police. I'm gonna tell you, your rights. You, you deal with the 
judge on Monday morning when it comes to your rights. At the time when you're being arrested, you want to survive the encounter, okay? Uh, the worst thing you can do is start telling the cop about your rights on the side of a road somewhere in the dark. Your rights to get beat up and end up black and blue on the side of the road. You want to survive the encounter. Let me say that again. Survive the encounter. Because typically what happens is once you are eliminated or beat up or incarcerated or locked down, everybody's going to believe the cop and nobody's going to believe you unless there's video footage. And then it's up in the air. Okay? But the first thing I'm going to tell you all is be quiet. Now, I had a Nigerian professor back at uh, TSU when I was working on a degree. He said, shut your feet. That's what he meant. He said, shut up. Have you, who, all, who all has seen the first 48? Has anybody seen the first 48? Okay. All they have to do is shut up. They're not asking you questions because they have, if they have all the answers, they're not going to ask you questions. Most folks incriminate themselves. So just shut up. Lawyer. I want to talk to my lawyer. I want to talk to my lawyer. Well, you know, we got a sandwich over here and a bottle of Sprite if you want it. I want to talk to my lawyer. That's the best thing you can do. Then you call somebody like Brother DeMarcus over here, and then he'll handle it from there. Okay? But you just, that's the first thing you should understand. Don't try to litigate your rights on the side of the road. And I think that's pretty common sense uh, sort of answer. The biggest thing that I hear from you, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Piggyback off that. Uh, it's really hard to fight what I call the police lie, which is I was in fear for my life. Uh, it, that, that's a hard one to fight because even even in places where the judges look like you, uh, there's a uh, they give officers what you call a subjective standard. So even if the ordinary reasonable person wouldn't think, hey, you know, Demarcus wanting to call his sister so she can hear what's going on. I'm like that, that's not threatening. But, you know, I, I've seen many occasions, I saw one two weeks ago in Dallas County Court where I had a client who was stopped for, they say he was speeding, that's a whole other issue. But then he gets stopped and he tries to call his girlfriend to put her on the phone. And this is a black, troop, black state trooper who got real aggressive with the real facts. And in court, what did he say? Well, I was I was in fear of my life. It was for everybody's sake that I didn't want him to make that phone call. And I say that to say, like, that is a really, really, really hard lie to overcome. So just be careful. And I'm, I'm wondering why that's a hard lie to overcome just because, like, it can be, it's so readily available for them to use. So what can we do to protect ourselves? Because, you, like you said, when the cameras go up and the phone calls start happening, they get even more aggressive. So how do you then protect yourself in those moments? So as Mr. Spurman said, first of all, you want to survive because you can't tell the story today. That's first and foremost. Uh, if you don't have any sort of dash camera in your car, get it. Uh, I drive a Tesla, and they come for cameras, and I still put more cameras in. Uh, I have a body camera on me many, on many occasions. It might, it might sound like overkill, but uh, it's one of those things that can save me. It was recently a lawyer uh, who lives just north of Dallas who was driving in his Corvette on a Sunday, just as he likes to do. Uh, he's been practicing for over 30 years, and the police got behind him and tried to say they arrested him, tried to say he was evading arrest. If it wasn't for the cameras that he put in his own car, uh, he would probably be facing trial right now in a county that's not Dallas County, so it wouldn't be his friend. And most people, I mean, even, even many of our own, just want to believe the police. They do. Uh, and so you don't want to be in a situation where you know, you've got 12 people deciding whether or not you can lease an apartment somewhere year later because you're a convicted felon. You know, from then on, even when you're dead, you're still a convicted felon. Your, your kids Google you. That's the first thing that comes up. Uh, so you want to just try to protect yourself. Not only, not, not only protect your life, but just protect your name as well. And I'd like, I'd like to piggyback off that. So here's, here's a common scenario. You're driving down the street, police get behind you. My suggestion, pull over immediately. Don't look for a 
Don't look for a, 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 a spot with a lot. Just pull over immediately. Turn your hand the lights on, pull all the way over. Roll all of your windows in. I don't care if it's 100 degrees outside or 40 degrees out. If you have interior lights, turn all of them on. The one thing I do is I keep my insurance right here at the, at, at, at the, uh, at the visor. Why do I do that? Because if I have to reach over to the glove compartment, and the police officer, officer may say, well, you, I didn't know what he was reaching for, and the gun's coming out. So I keep it up here. I already have my wallet in my hand. Uh, uh, as, as I'm pulled over, I pull my driver's license out. I got my windows all the way down. I got my insurance. By the time the officer gets to the side of my window, I'm like this. You got my driver's license and my insurance. Well, do you want to know why I'm pulling you over? Officer, I'm sure you have your reasons. Well, do you know how fast you're going? Officer, I wasn't looking at the dial at the time, but I'm sure you have your reasons. You see, so that cuts out on any, any unnecessary conflict because they're looking for a reason. Other hands on the steering wheel. Sometimes my son's in the car with me. Say hello to the state trooper. Say hello to the officer. And we back to it. So you don't, you're not incriminating yourself by saying, oh, officer, yeah, you got me. I was going 70 in a 65. You're not saying anything. You got your driver's license. You got your insurance. So he has no reason. You want a surviving encounter. You want to make it as quick and painless as possible. Let me tell you something. I got this lawyer that's down the hall for me. $50 to fix, to, to, to deal with a, a traffic ticket. $50. So you're gonna fight with this person who probably doesn't know you for 50 bucks. That's what I want you to understand. You gotta put your egos to the side because they got the gun and the badge and the power to take, to take your life. And more likely than not, you guys watch the news, nothing's gonna happen to them if they do. So this is how much a traffic ticket costs to get taken care of. $50 and sometimes 100. So keep that in mind the next time you wanna fight on the side of the highway with a cop about a traffic ticket. They making money. That's the thing. That's how they generate revenue. It's a hustle. <laughs> Y'all hear me? It's a hustle. It is what it is. I recognize it. It's a game. But you don't want to get caught up in that hustle. Just keep that in mind. Okay? I'm glad you mentioned that because I feel like a lot of people, especially black people, feel like they can't afford a lawyer in those moments. And if they get a court afforded a um, lawyer, then it's just like somebody just sort of the last of their situation. Here's the thing. If, if you're a criminal, we got some criminals. You, you already know the laws. But if you're just an average citizen getting the traffic ticket, it's nothing to fight on. You got warrants out. You know you got warrants out. You know what you did. You, you play the game. It is what it is. But I'm talking to the average folks who just, you have a half, half and half a police encounter, encounter. Give them the, don't fight with these guys. They are, look, look. My next door neighbor is a former sheriff for the Houston, uh, uh, Harris County uh, Sheriff Department. He told me, and he on several occasions, police officers are trained and taught to win every encounter. Now let that register. So even if they're dead wrong, they have to win every encounter. Why is that? Because there's one million police officers in the United States, more or less, and there's 350, Amer 350 million Americans. What happens if the average American thinks I can win against this police officer? We got anarchy. So they're taught to win everything and we'll deal, we'll, we'll win the encounter, we'll deal with everything else on the back end. But you've got to maintain this, this, this thin blue line of the So I want y'all to keep that in mind. My thing is I don't want y'all to get caught up. And I'm giving you the same advice that I give my own son. This is the same advice that I follow my, myself. Survive the encounter. That situation that happened to me, it happened on a Friday. By Monday morning, I filed a federal lawsuit against the Houston Police Department. That's how I did it. And we quietly settled it outside the court, uh, maybe three or four months thereafter. So that's how I did it with police officers. Do not let these people become a part, permanent part of your life. I don't have a problem with cops. As long as they stay in their place, I'm gonna stay in my place, but you do not want to be the person whose tombstone reads shot by a cop over a traffic ticket that was only worth $50. Keep that in mind, okay? Uh, I wanna switch lanes a little bit. Mark has kind of touched on um, evictions and um, dealing with police officers and sheriffs as tenants. And you know, we are coming off of a pandemic. Um, a lot of people fell in very unfortunate situations 
situations and had to face, um, you know, different addictions and things. So, um, what are some important rights and protections that tenants should be familiar with in these situations? And are there any specific laws or regulations that vary between the jurisdictions? Well, I know in Dallas, in Dallas County, um, and I, I know it's this way in Houston as well, most evictions are handled at what, what are called the justice and peace level. Uh, and so, there are, like, here, you've got legal aid and things like that that actually really do a good job of that. Uh, I've had people call my office and say, hey, I'm being threatened, like, I'm, uh, I'm being threatened with eviction. And the first thing I ask is, you know, do they have an order? Do they have an order? If they don't have an order, they can't. They can't kick you out, essentially. You, have, you do have rights. Uh, so if you don't see an order, you're fine. If, you, if they do have an order, what normally happens next is, is that you'll see a constable or somebody from you know, your local sheriff's office coming. They're not just coming to, to talk to you. If they come, then, then it's time to go. So that's, that's the biggest thing with that is they can say what they want to say, but a manager can't just come in because I mean, you have one, at, at that level, without an order, you have a greater right of possession of that property than they do. But if there's an order, then, then, you know, then, there's, then you're kind of stuck. Uh, but again, before they do that, then they have to serve you. And uh, they can't just leave it on your door. Like, if you're hiding, and they can prove that you're hiding, then at some point, uh, your county's going to you know, say that you know, there have been a uh, sufficient due diligence to where that, that suffices. Uh, but in most cases, after serving, don't ignore them. I, I've had so many people who come to me and, uh, you know, I'm looking at everything and they can't afford a lawyer. And many of them just go down and just have a conversation with the Justice of the Peace uh, Court and the judge there, many of whom are not lawyers, which actually puts uh, most folks in a better situation. And they can work things out. Um, so do that first and foremost. And because the people, justice of the peace courts, like the, their jurisdiction is really, really, really small. So you can, you can win or lose an election by 50 people. Literally two streets can kick a judge off or keep a judge on. So if you have a judge in that particular district that is just continuously evicting people, and all you really need to do is talk to you know your neighbors, and then at the next election, I promise you they'll be gone. Uh, but just pay attention to the orders. That's the most important. Um, and then Dennis, before we came on stage, you talked to me about a lot of policy changes that you had. Um, did you want to expound on any yeah, sure, sure. changes? So, so, uh, so uh, I have a podcast called Dennis Furlan Unfiltered, where I get an opportunity to say a lot of the things that I can't normally say. In a courtroom, uh, I've been invited up to, uh, to Maryland uh, to speak to uh, issues of men's rights. I'm an advocate for black men and black women. What that means is that I recognize that black men and black boys have certain requirements and needs that are not met by the current legislation that's good uh, or affects all black people. So, Things like father's rights, uh, paternity uh, fraud, 30% of the women, 30% of the men who are tested, who want to be tested, turns out they're not the fathers of the children. 51% uh, of black men in America don't have children. Um, these are things, and aren't married, so these are sort of things. So there, of course, their needs are going to be different. One of those things that we talk about, and I want to give a big shout out to Dr. Tia San Johnson, and you guys, my podcast is Dennis Furlan Unfiltered. Many of you guys may know who I am. Uh, but, but, but I'm very, very adamant about the defense of black men and boys, largely because I have three sons of my own. Nevertheless, one of the things that we talk about is we talk about uh, uh, law enforcement reform. Now, there's this concept called uh, qualified immunity. If you've ever heard of that term, put your hand in the air. And if you listen to people, they say qualified immunity, qualified immunity. My first trial as a young spry lawyer, fresh out of, of law school, having two law degrees, was against the city of New Orleans, against a uh, police officer who had 
I said falsely arrested my client. His name is Joe Jones versus the city of New Orleans. And I'm telling you, I have my little tight blue civil rights suit on. I was about 100 pounds smaller, you know, fresh out of the KB, uh, what is it, KB suits or something like that. I was ready, you know. And apparently, we had sued all these lawyers. And, and, and you know, my, my friend, he wasn't my friend, but he was my co counsel. But nevertheless, he was the guy that graduated before he drug me into the case. And, um, you know, we had, he had sued all these lawyers before the case was over. And we, when we rested our case in chief, the judge, the, the opposing counsel said, hey, you know what, we want to file a motion to dismiss these guys. They haven't, uh, the, these other lawyers, so they let four or five other lawyer, uh, uh, NOPD officers go under qualified immunity. That was all the way after my client had got arrested. So. What do we do? Because what is the real problem? The real problem is police interaction. How do we stop them from having the right to interact with you? You understand? What, how, you ever heard the term, any country folks in here, you ever heard of something called nipping in the bud? You heard that? So nipping it in the bud. Remember this, write this down. Terry versus Ohio. Say that back for me, y'all. Terry versus Ohio. All right, let's do it all together. One, two, three. Terry versus Ohio. Open the door for police to run up on you even if you haven't actually committed a crime. Mm. So what we need to do is we need to undermine and get rid of Right, and, and, and my esteemed colleague can tell you all about how police officers justify what they're doing, the searches, the frisks, the handcuffs, and that led to a whole line of cases. They can pull you out your car, check your glove compartment and everything else, because of the line of cases that follow Terry versus Ohio. It allows us to exist in a Gestapo state. It is the reason why they could halfway kind of maybe possibly think about justifying stop and frisk even though that was purely unconstitutional. Terry versus Ohio gives the cops the right to say, hey, you know what? There's a lot of different reasons why I'm gonna stop him. And yeah, you know what? C color is one of them, but that's just one of them. But really, in his mind, he knows that's the main reason, but all he has to do is, well, you know, this guy was wearing blue, and uh, it looked black, and Gang I got a on the radio last week that said a guy wearing black might have robbed a store down here, and he's black and he's wearing blue, but nevertheless, it's enough black on him for me to pull him over, put him on the curb, and put him in handcuffs. Terry versus Ohio opens that door, we need to get rid of that. We need to undermine that, we need to do, because that stops the police interaction. The next thing is, and cut me off the long one, no, I'm, I'm, I'm listening to your dog. The next thing you need to do is you need to start suing police officers. Now here's the problem with that. There's a public policy, right? How many of y'all pay taxes? How many of y'all pay too many damn taxes? How many of y'all are sick and tired of paying taxes? So what happens if we start suing police officers and the taxpayers have to pay it? What do you think is going to happen? Taxes go up. What happens if you if a lawyer makes a mistake or a doctor makes a mistake? Does the state pay for that? Nope. The malpractice insurance pays for that. So we need to force police officers to get their own insurance policies. And let me tell you what that does. That's, I know a lot about that. You know, I've been car accidents for a long time. So an insurance company, something I enjoy doing because the checks come on time. You understand what I'm saying? 10,000, 3,000, 7,000, you add all that up together, you can get your Escalade on 20, <laughs> okay? So I like that. I don't like waiting for people to bring me my money at the child's house. No, sir, I don't do criminal. I don't, no, I want my check from the insurance company. It's just like having a real job. Nevertheless, what happens is those insurance companies, they do a thorough check over you to see, you know, what's the likelihood that this person is going to do the thing that I'm insuring them for? Right? If you're a bad driver, you got 14 tickets, speeding tickets, car accident. You think your insurance rates are going to be high or low? High, right? So if you got, a, if you're a police officer and you have seven citizen accounts, you've been sued once. What does that mean? Insuring you is going to cost what? More money. Now you might have to pay five or six hundred dollars a month if you're a bad cop with a bad record. That way you might say, it's no big, I don't want to be a cop anymore. But bottom line is that that regulate you then you allow the market to regulate itself. On top of that, the taxpayers, taxes don't go up, 
because this man has his own, or a woman has her own insurance policy paid. And it can be mandatory, just like legal malpractice insurance, just like uh, medical malpractice insurance. So now, what have you done? Here's the trick. I tell, talk to a lot of legislators. I, you know, listen. Now you got the insurance lobby saying, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. Mm -hmm. we, <laughs> you know, we can charge them. Yeah, we can charge this million cops. Yeah, we, that sounds like a So you got the insurance lobby versus the police lobby. So you let these, the one thing I used to love to do when I was a young lawyer is I'd sue them all and let them fight it out amongst each other. So you sue these huge behemoths and let them do the fight, and then guess what? You just go there and, 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 and pick up the carcass afterwards. So you let you force these two entities, these billion dollar corporations, to fight against this, 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 this immovable, immovable force, and then you reap the benefit. All that's gonna require is for us to put the right legislators in office and propose a bill. Now it's out there, okay? But I, 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 I can talk. I got one more thing, but I want you to finish. And then we got get some questions from the audience, so who the work is going to work How many people have heard the term community policing or, or uh, Community police, basically, you know, or the idea that we want the community and the police to work together. How many people have heard of this? And so, uh, from a policy standpoint, first of all, I agree with everything you say. Everything. Uh, one thing that I think can help. We can get rich suing Wait. cops if they have it. Uh, one of the things that bothers me, one thing that really bothers me when I go to court and bothers me when I was a prosecutor, uh, are the lies that you, that you see uh, the police tell folks. I've had many cases uh, that come from the first 48, because you know Dallas is one of the places that they work in, a bunch of them. And so and I've had cases where the police will say, hey, you know, we talked to Johnny and Johnny said you did it. Or, hey, we've got your fingerprints. Or we've got you on camera. Or your mother said called us and, and apologized to us for you doing it. And all those things can be and have been complete lies. Uh, but they're able to do that. And that's another question that I get a lot from, from clients. Can they just lie to me like that? And the answer is, yeah. The law allows them to lie to you. And these lies have, have destroyed communities, they've destroyed families, and me personally, I don't think that you can ask a community to believe in a police department that can and will lie to it when they want to. So, one idea that I've always had is that the DA's office, the district, district attorney's office, and the police department can enact what they call a truth policy. So on a federal level, similar to Terry versus Ohio, the Supreme Court has said that police officers can lie. We can, I can lie to you and, and, and say that I, you know, somebody just said you did something. But police departments do have the right and the authority to say, you know what, we're not gonna allow our police officers a lot of people in the community. And if they do, we're gonna discipline them. And so I challenge all of you when, you, when you go back to your communities and you talk to law enforcement uh, and these elected officials, ask them, hey, what are your thoughts on a truth policy? And when you phrase it like that, who can be against the truth policy? You know? Uh, I think that every police department in America should have a policy to where they're not gonna allow their police officers to lie to people. If we can't get it through truth and through real good police work, we're just not gonna get it. And, uh, and if a police officer violates that policy, then they will be disciplined. And they can put those policies in place. And the district attorney's office can do the same. Your local DA's office can say, you know what, we are not gonna prosecute a case where we can literally see right here that somebody was lied to. I had a case recently well, the police officer lied to me and said he had a search warrant for DNA. And then when I asked for the search warrant, he gets it later on that day and it's signed after he said he had it. So I don't think you can build a community or build those relationships that we really do need if one side is able to just lie to the other side when they want to. If you were in a relationship, boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever, and your significant other is just consistently lying to you, it's gonna be hard for y'all to build some trust. And so that's one thing that I really, really want to happen nationwide, is that our police departments and our prosecutor's offices 
should have true policies. We are not going to accept cases uh, where there have been lies throughout, or lies at all. Because the moment my client lies in court, everything he says after that doesn't matter. If he loses credibility on the first lie, why shouldn't it be that way for the police officers as well? Agree, 1,000%. Uh, so we want to open the floor up for questions. There are two microphones at the front of the stage. If you have any questions, you can please line up in front of the microphone. Uh, we ask that one question per person, if you guys can keep it to a minimum. Um, and if y'all have no questions, we have a million, a million more up here, so. I, I, got, I, I want to add a couple other points. Police unions and traffic tickets. We also, the power behind the police are the police unions. And we need to really undermine, and I know everybody is a union person, yeah, you know, but you know why our schools are failing? It's because we got teachers unions that keep bad teachers in place. And the same thing happens with police unions. You got police unions that keep bad cops in place. So you need to eliminate that shit. The last thing is traffic tickets. As I said earlier, it's a scam, it's a hustle. They use it to drive up their, their, their fund rates. They use it to fund their retirement benefits. And look, I don't have a problem with police, good police officers doing good police work. I have a problem with crooks and badges who want to harass people, who want to get, who have some issues for whatever reason. Maybe they got beat up in high school or something like that. That's the problem I have. And so we need to undermine the monetary incentive for them to initiate contact. So that was my thought so far. Because let's talk about the other 
The other right. five percent that go to trial, most of them come in second place. And not always because they're guilty. We're in Dallas County. Dallas County leads the nation in wrongful conviction. We are number one. There are 254 counties in Texas. So we're number one out of 254 before we even get to the other 49 states. And so every, every week here, you look on the news when I'm in the courthouse and I see some older man who's getting released, whose mother has died while he's in prison, serving time for something he didn't do, uh, whose wife has moved on and, and, and had another family because, you know, you've got 30 years. What is she supposed to do? Uh, and I think people see that, and I think it polarizes them. Uh, our system is just, is just jacked up. Uh, we don't have enough prosecutors that look like us. Uh, and a lot of times when we have the ones that look like us, they just kind of want to keep their position so they don't look out for us. Uh, <laughs> I could go on and on uh, about that. But uh, the short answer is the system is broken. It is, it is, it is utterly broken. Let me, let me. So, I'm a civil litigation attorney, but every now and then I get caught up in a criminal case. So recently, I had a fellow who was out in the water, they call him sick birds. Anybody know what a bird is? I'm sorry, what did you say? Kilo of cocaine. <laughs> so by my estimation, a kilo of cocaine is $25,000, right? So if you got caught with six, that's 150. You know how much I'm gonna charge you to defend you? hundred and fifty thousand dollars. That's gonna be how much I need, and I'm gonna need half up front. Why? Because I'm gonna spend a lot of time and a lot of money doing it, and I'm not messing around. Again, I've been practicing law 23 years, and just settled a case for 32 million dollars last week. You understand? So you're not going to get someone who's gonna have work half fast. In other words, I'm not working fast. I can. You understand what I'm saying? So it costs money on that side. But what you don't realize is that the prosecutor's office also has to pay people. What if everybody who got charged with a case tried the case? How long would that take? What, what's the jury do? Nine or six? I'm, 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 well, well. You're going to run out of people. You understand? And you're going to work the prosecutor's office to death. Most prosecutors are very young lawyers straight out of law school. I tried a case here in Dallas County. Uh, about 13 years ago with my dad. Now he had been practicing law before he passed away for 43 years. And the young lawyer said, we've never had a caliber lawyer like you. He came in there and he had the little stuff up, he turned his stuff around, he started talking about America and how this is the greatest country and we got the greatest. And the jury acquitted him. And the situation was, baby mama was getting the last paper, <laughs> ex-wife was getting the last alimony payment, and uh, and so she knocked on the door, he gave it to her, and then she still mad, kept knocking on the door. She tried to rush in the house, he pushed her out. She called the cops and said it was assault. It was a big mess, but he was defending himself with the national get him off. That costs money. If you start, if you, if you, they want to clean you out. They don't want you to try the case. So they're going to say, look, we're going to give you 100 years. If, 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 if we try, we'll give you 10 if you don't. And you look at it that like, I don't have $150,000 to give somebody like that. Give Mr. Spurl 150000 I can't do that. Your mama can't put the house up. You ain't got that type of money. So what do you do? What are your options? It's an economic decision you make. The same thing they make. So they sway you and push you over into doing what's beneficial for the state. You understand? Yeah. Yeah. I'm so sorry. Oh, yeah. I'm, 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 I'm passing. Because, <laughs> like I say, I'm, I was there. Uh, there's two big tracks in the criminal justice system bond trap and the probation trap. Uh, so let's just say you, you get arrested for something and you, you post a bond. First of all, you gotta pay 10% of whatever that bond is. Let's say your bond is $50,000. You gotta find a bond company and, and pay them in some way, shape, form, or fashion at least $5,000. Nine times out of 10, they gonna want you to put up granny's ass collateral or something. While you're out on bond, now in Dallas County, what they've been doing to a lot of people they say it's for one reason, but we all got common sense here. You'll see what I'm talking about. They'll put you on what's called an electronic leg monitor uh, while you're out on bonds. After you've paid that $5,000, they're 
and had to go get the car out of the tow if they were legal. Three hundred dollars. You month. have to pay uh, monthly for this leg monitor. Yep. And so they're going to know exactly where you, this is all about presumed innocence. Uh, so they're going to know exactly where you are, and in most cases, you cannot leave your home unless you get permission from your leg monitor officer. You want to go to church with your mother? You can't go. Hey, you want to just go check on your mother? You can't go. Uh, you probably lost your job when you got arrested, so you need to go look for another. Well, you got to get a, an approved list of places, or you got to get it approved before they'll let you go. That's just not how a lot of folks don't look for a job. So what happens a lot of times is I have clients that are saying, I don't know. If this is what it is while I'm on bond, if I just plead guilty and, and do probation, will they let me out of this man? And so you're stuck between a rock and a hard place to where you have to like decide whether you want to exercise your rights or get off that thing so you can get on with life. I have I had a situation where I had a, a woman, she was a mother of five, who had been beaten by her kid's father. And uh, stood up for herself one day. We even had independent witnesses calling 911 saying he is jumping in her car. And she got arrested for aggravated assault with a deadly weapon somehow. While she was out on bond, she had to get on one of those leg monitors. The way that she fed her five children is that she did against the car. So she would go and deliver things. Well, they wouldn't let her do that. So, she stuck having to, and what she ended up doing was she had to have her kids move back with her mother in a totally different state because she couldn't afford to feed her kids. And then she also couldn't afford to pay me. I stayed on the case, but that's just one of many situations. I've had another young man who lived right next door to his grandmother who had hip surgery. Like literally, this is his apartment, this is hers. He couldn't even go to the adjoining apartment. I showed the judge pictures of his grandmother on the floor. So these are the things that you do that, 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 they, that they'll trap you with because they make fighting for your rights so miserable yeah. to where that's how you become a part of that 95%. And they say, oh, it's for the community's protection. No, it's not. It is not. And most of these things are self-funded. You're paying for it. Yeah. So they're making money off of it. Broken system all over the system. And probation is the same way. Sir. I have two follow questions. One question, please. Can we keep it to what we almost done with this one? Kind of tying into what y'all said about uh, our rights being violated a lot of times. Uh, how can, uh, what's the best precautions to go about where police officers are trying to violate your rights for illegally searching a vehicle, just saying they, they smell marijuana? Like, how, how is it, just a smell is Research. And that's all based on their, uh, on their ideology. Yeah. Right now, what you have, you have a lot of uh, DA's officers that are, that are progressive DA's policies, that are officers that are saying, hey, we're not going to um, support, you know, the smell of bar marijuana being probable cause of search. Now, under the law, the law states that if a police officer smells marijuana, then that gives them probable cause to search anywhere in your vehicle where marijuana could be. Well, a joint could be anywhere. So now they can search your whole vehicle. The problem is, you can't smell marijuana when you get in court and you put the video in for the judge. So basically, it's, it's, a, it's a who do you believe scenario. And who do you think that judge is going to believe? You that says there wasn't a smell of marijuana, or the officer that says there was a smell? Of marijuana. And so my my thing with that is it's just kind of like a traffic ticket. You can't fight it out there. If they I have so many cases where they say they smell it and we've gone to the tow yard while the car is still there and there's no smell. Uh, and I've made note of it, made videos of it. It it's it's an uphill battle. The only thing I would tell all of you is to push your local police departments and your local prosecutor's offices. Just like the truth policy I said, you guys can change policy. There's so many uh, prosecutor's offices now, Dallas included, that say
They have their own people go to throw them softball questions so they can throw it on YouTube or throw it on IG and increase their following. Everybody's like, oh, well, Daddy, that's, oh, they're really doing something. No, they're not. The whole thing was a damn show. Go there. How do you feel about a truth policy? Do you think that cops should be able to lie to us? Do you, are, you, are you in favor of prosecuting cases that are built on lies? You know, what are you doing in your DA's office to make sure that your prosecutors are encouraged to hide evidence? How are your prosecutors promoted? Are you looking at dismissive stats? It matters. So, the long and short of it is the advocating policy change. Let me ask um, So, so my primary practice is federal court. Like uh, I realized a long time ago, you want to, it's like the difference between the NFL and the SEC. They, they play great football, but the NFL, that's, that's, that's what Urgent Marshall operated. And so the vast majority of my litigation over the past, um, uh, well, my first lawsuit, my first trial was in federal court. And that was back in, my God, I can't believe it, 2003. So that's all I do. And what I found is, when you send out the federal court subpoenas, they respond. So uh, on that question, how do I get this evidence? Because as a trial lawyer, my dad taught me this with problem solvers. The guy that taught me how to practice law, a, a small Jewish man from Chicago, he never backed down. The judge says something you don't like, you try it, you take an appeal. You can Google me, or what is it, West, West Salt? Next, from about 2000 to 2005, I probably had about 15 or 20 frivolous appeals just because I wasn't going back then. Because that's the way I cut my teeth. And I learned that from a, a short, Michael J. Beacon, he passed away in February last year. My dad passed away the year before that in November. So I lost two great men in my life back then. But what that's caused me to do is have to be very creative. So uh, I got a cousin. I'm not going to say his name, my children know his name. He the one that got caught with the six birds, coming from California up through, allegedly, right? And, and you know, what I had to do is try to figure out, and he said that, that, that the uh, people in Nebraska, the cops in Nebraska, Nebraska suppressed the evidence. So then I looked at it, well, it's, 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 it's federal. So that means the DEA has a copy of it. The DEA, FBI which is over in El Paso, has a copy of the original report. They said they caught him in there with some diapers, you know, and you know, paraphernalia, diapers and dope was in the, in, 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 of course, I don't do criminal, but I seem to keep getting caught up in it. Uh, but they caught, they said they found the evidence in the tire. They uh, said there were male diapers and there was some envelopes with some Spanish names on them. The case went all the way to the Supreme Court. I wasn't his lawyer. I'm just trying to clean up the mess. But the bottom line is, I can file an in-rate lawsuit in the Western District of Texas, subpoena those original uh, reports, and then compare them to what the to, to what the district attorney, not district, or what the sheriff's office in that Nebraska town gave, and say, Judge, look, this is not even on the report, or this is, and this is what they did give us, and this didn't. It's grounds for possible uh, a new trial. I don't do criminal law. I just try to get problems solved. Okay, so that's an obvious, a creative way. Sometimes when you practice law, it's, it's just like painting a picture, it's like writing a song. You gotta creatively figure these things out. They give you these tools, and I tell the lawyers that I train, anything they can, unless they tell you you can't do it, you do it. You understand? And that's, what, that's the way I practice law, and that's how I've been successful over these past two, going on three decades. I hope that answers your question. Yes, you need better lawyers. Thank That's you, what Mr. I'm saying. Uh, <laughs> Talking too much. Hi. Hi. Yes, my name is Maude Jarrett. I'm a sophomore at uh, Dallas's County Law Magnet. Okay. And my question is, uh, my question is, uh, from a legal perspective, how do you feel we could prevent uh, the, uh, the mass incarceration of blacks from evolving into another system of control or institutional oppression? So, did you know the incarceration of black men is going down? Yeah. It says the 1990s is slowly dropping. Uh, problem is this, ladies, and I want you to hear me. I want all you, where the ladies at? Oh, where the ladies at? Put your hands in the air. The incarceration rate for black women is going up. Wow. 
the incarceration rate for women in general is going up. Mm. Why? Because you make better prisoners. Mm. Let me say that again. Women make better prisoners. You ain't gonna be in that bitch pressing 500 pounds hitting the bars on the side of the head. You gonna be in there cooperating and putting them little things, girl, I don't know why I'm here, girl. I just, I just stabbed them and then I just blacked out, girl. You see what I'm saying? You make better prisoners, it's more problem. Did you know that you can invest in prisons right now on the New York, on the New York Stock Exchange? You make better prisoners. I would much rather have you in my prison than this guy. We gotta watch him. You, we, you know, you got, you see what I'm saying? So how do we stop that? You gotta curb this behavior. Let me tell you something. You are and always will be the same people you were when they brought you over here. I tell people on my podcast all the time, a stolen people on a stolen land will never have peace. You're never gonna have peace in this country. That's why uh, Marcus Garvey told us, Africans for Africa, go back. That's why the Honorable Elijah Muhammad told us to separate Minister Louis Farrakhan, uh, Malcolm X. You're never gonna have peace in this country, so you're gonna have to play by the rules. The Holy Quran teaches us what? And I'm Christian, but I read mean it, because it's the truth. Yeah. It says when you're behind enemy yeah. lines, you may not be able to practice like you want to, because they're stabbing. So you're gonna have to curb this toxic behavior. It seems to me like over the past, I don't know, 30, 40 years, Y'all been cutting up and acting a fool. I just saw a video, a woman was surfing across the fruit in the grocery store, you got ladies fighting. When was the last time you saw a bunch of men fighting it out? I see women fighting it out all the time. Airport, you don't want to take a flight from uh, uh, Chicago to Decatur, Georgia. It's gonna pop off, especially if it's on Spirit Airlines. I call it evil Spirit Airlines. You understand what I'm saying? Because you're making yourself a target and they're gonna change the policy. Let me say this again. They're already saying these black American women, hmm, we used to think they were just, uh, you know, what do they call You know, uh, sexual objects. Now they refer to you as violence. And so they're gonna start changing the policy and targeting you, why? Number one, because there's not gonna be, the public is not gonna support it because they've seen all this horrible press on the internet. Not that other people of other races don't do it, but they always gonna showcase you. You see what I mean? And you make better prisoners. You see how they kill two birds with one stone? That's how the, that's how the system of white supremacy works. Mm. Okay? They let you do something and then they, they, they uh, capitalize on that behavior. They, they pathologize your behavior. They capitalize on things you like to do. You like to smoke weed, we're gonna make it illegal. How are we gonna do that? We're gonna say it's making white women have sex with these Negroes. So we're gonna make it illegal. We used to be legal. You see what I'm saying? So this is how that works. So you gotta be smart when you're out there. Recognize that you're in a war and you're behind enemy lines. Okay, brother? Thank you, Mr. Sperling. Uh, Mary? Hi. Hi. Hello. Uh, my, my question is, can you, uh, if a person is on probation, um, or if you have no other fees or whatever, you paid up all your court costs, your fees, whatever, are you able to get off of probation early? Yes. Um, a, it depends on how the case was closed. Okay. So talk to me afterwards because it's, it's very case specific. But the short answer is, yes, um, you can get off, in most cases, you can get off probation early. Uh, most jurisdictions require that you get at least to the halfway mark uh, and have completed all the conditions. Like when you're placed on probation, you get a list of things you gotta do uh, by the time you get off. Uh, it's the classes, it's, it's, it's a lot of it's money, of course. It's the fees, it's, it's, it's the court costs, it's all of those things. A lot of people like to get a jump start on it and just get it done. Okay. Uh, if you can show the court that, that, you, that you've done all that, what can be done is, 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 and I've done this numerous times, I filed what's called a motion for early termination of community supervision. And sometimes, you know, what, what happens next is the prosecutor will review it. Sometimes they'll just say, you know what, you're right, I don't even want to waste my time with it, and they'll sign what's called an agreed order. If, if the prosecutor and the defense lawyer are coming to the judge together and they're agreeing on something, the judge is just going to sign the phone. But you have to get an attorney in order to do that. You don't have to get an attorney to do it, but I would advise anybody to do it without an attorney. Okay. You know, uh, because you don't want to mess up your, your, your biggest shot to get it done. Because okay. if you come back two weeks later with a lawyer, then we're like, you were just here. And it just falls on deaf ears. 
Uh, if the prosecutor disagrees with it, I'm so sorry, then you can ask for a hearing and you can present your case to the court as to why you should be released from probation. Because whether or not you're released from probation depends on the judge ultimately, not, not the prosecutor. All right, we're gonna hit these last, thank you. We're gonna hit these last two questions and then we're gonna break out, um, cause it's lunch time right now. No, everybody hungry. Um, so sir. Hi, uh, my name is Nachi Shakur. Um, I had a question, I had an experience with a um, white supremacist neighborhood a while back for, um, like they hit me with their car and um, they basically, I'd like to warn you know, all black Americans that they have a form of human trafficking, which is basically like, um, where they cause you extreme psychological distress. They'll follow you around nonstop, um, just harassing you nonstop. They did this to um, uh, Courtney Mallory up in Colorado. I don't know if you guys heard of him. Um, but uh, I'm just wondering what is to be done about the sort of, because um, law enforcement were heavily involved with this harassment, so they basically have this thing where they have a bunch of criminals harass you and do crimes against you, and then the, and then law enforcement turns a blind eye to that, and then law enforcement also tries to enforce the law against you as part of that targeting and harassment. So I'm sort of curious what you think needs to be done about the sort of um, selective enforcement of the law in which to like target and prosecute, or target and persecute black people, especially people. I think I understand the question. If I'm not answering it, let me know. Um, a lot of that is administrative, administrative, administration specific. When we had Obama in office, uh, the DOJ uh, did a whole lot to uh, target uh, white supremacy. You know, the biggest threat to America on a federal level isn't somebody from another country sending them, you know, coming over here and fly another plane into a building. Uh, you know, that is horrible. The biggest threat now is just that, white supremacy. Uh, so as far as what we can do, vote, really. You, know, you, you know, you just gotta vote. But that, that, federal prosecution is such a different beast. He can tell you that. Um, when a president comes in, whatever that agenda is, they'll put local assistant U.S local U.S. attorneys into those districts with their agenda. Uh, and I'm not, I don't, I don't care who you voted for, uh, but from 2016 to 2020, that just wasn't, wasn't a priority. Uh, and now, honestly, I don't, I don't know what the priority is of the, of the uh, United States Attorney at this moment, but that's kind of where that, that happened. Adam Thank you, sir. Just, was like, is, so there's no like, is there, sorry, I guess it's, sort of, it's just kind of elaborating on it, but like, is there like a special thing? Like, because I'm having a bit of trouble just like in communication with attorneys that are actually like, you know, because uh, I kind of have a big case that's like, you know, so I'm just, you know, it's, it's like, it's sort of, uh, uh, are you saying you have a case of your own, like in general yeah. right now? Yeah. Did you want to speak with him afterwards? Well, so that's, you guys can yeah, talk that's, that's true. Yeah, that, that, and it's just, you know, it's, it's sort of like, I'm trying to get to the right attorneys that actually want to do stuff, you know, instead of attorneys that are just sort of, you know, part of the established thing and they don't want to, you know, they want to be hands off in the situation if it's too, you know, uh, you know, but, you know I'd, say, I'd say try to talk to one of these guys after the fact, okay. because it sounds like you have like a complex situation that yeah. then you probably need some, some one-on-one -on -one conversation or legal advice about. Uh, so should I just wait at the end? Yeah, you can catch these guys, you guys will be here, right? For the rest of the for the rest of the day. Okay, okay, in the city. Get them keys back to the Okay, okay. <laughs> can catch, catch the markers. My, my, my Instagram handle is, is D-W-A-R-D-E-S-Q. -E D -W -A -R -D -E -S -Q. Uh, I check it, if you message me on it, like I will, I will message you back. Uh, so I'll, I'll try to connect with you after this. Can you repeat that please? D as in Dallas, W-A-R-D-E-S-Q. D Ward E S Q is my Instagram name. We're, we're gonna have an announcement at the end, guys. Let's get this last question so we can get out of here and have lunch. Thank you. Peace and love, family. Hi. Blessing and love. My name is Dr. Sean Mary, but I just want to reflect on something about Cathedral and Seal God. There's an organization that I belong to, and anybody 
whether the foundation of that can join. And even if you buy a gun and wear a license, they see a license that they know already that you carry a gun. License or unlicensed. My sharing with everyone is to join this organization because I'm licensed. And this organization, you can join, that pays up to $3 million. $1 million for a couple of attorneys, $1 million for a bail. And it's reciprocity in everything in the United States. And it's also paid up to wherever we lose it somewhere. So I just want to share. Thank you, sir, very much. I appreciate you. Um, you guys give our gentlemen a round of applause. Thank you guys so much for all of this legal counsel and legal advice y'all gave to free today. <laughs> two o'clock, I know we are well over two o'clock, but two o'clock begins our lunch break. Um, the next time we're in this room, I think at 4.30, we're having um, the Children in Education Workshop, if you guys are interested. Um, but continue to enjoy today. Thank you, Mr. Sperling. No problem. And if you want to interact with us live, if you have YouTube, I know everybody has YouTube, right? Just Google Dennis Sperling. And you know all the advanced stuff they say. Just find my page. Dennis Sperling. I typically have a night in the show. You can ask questions like that, and I will entertain them live. All right. And then, Mr. Warren. Uh, my IG is probably the easiest way to get a hold of me. Uh, D W A R D E S Q, uh, D Ward E S Q. Uh, my office number, you can text it. I will. I I see the text messages. 214-777-3319. 214-777-3319. Y'all go yeah. vote. Serve on juries. Get on the jury. Vote. Ask questions. Thank right. you guys so much. And I am Bree from the Is a Radio Podcast. My handle on Instagram is Bree.A-R-I-E-R. Thank you guys so much for joining us and enjoy lunch. Amen. I call up True Family. This was the legal panel at the FBA Expo, Saturday, 27th. Stay tuned for more information.